Okay, so we will start uh, just uh, uh, now, and uh, I would like to introduce uh, to all of you uh, Professor Armen Edigarian, Rector of the Jagiellonian University. And uh, 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 the first person, that's uh, 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 Elena Caldirola from Pavia University, uh, Director of uh, Servicio Innovazione Didactica e Comunicazione Digital. Uh, dear Jacek, dear uh, Rector, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to have a role in this event. Uh, it is uh, the third rector of the Jagiellonian University of the University uh, of Krakowia I meet and I have the opportunity to interact with, and uh, it is really a pleasure for me uh, this for this beloved uh, city and nation. So just a short presentation of myself, just in some seconds. Uh, uh, I act here as the director of uh, the e-learning center of the University of Pavia, so-called, say, Education Innovation Unit. And uh, Jacek asked me to prepare a short presentation, and my focus is the university response, the, the my university response to the COVID-19 uh, crisis, crisis, and uh, in a nutshell, what was the lesson learned and teacher perspectives. Uh, okay. Um, this is just in a slide. Uh, my university, the situation, the picture of my university when the COVID knocked at the our doors. Uh, we were the first, and we are at the present, the first Italian universities um, so uh, identified by Chelsea, who is a very important uh, institute uh, of research and studies in Italy. So we are the best university in that rank, uh, 20,000 to 40,000 students. You can learn from the um, box at the left, uh, which is the university body. Uh, the consistence of the University of Pavia with a small town, that is a small town, hmm? it's a small town of province, but very, very important because um, the University of Pavia was in the past the first university in Lombardy hmm? and the ancient one. Uh, you can see in the box at the right the international agreements and the network uh, we are part of. The courses, uh, the body of uh, in the box at the, at the right, uh, courses and uh, our, what we offer to our students. But I want to point your attention to facilities and especially to the second item of this list. 22 university colleges. What are colleges for us? Our particular organization in our city where students live, but they are not simply dormitory. They are special organization with a special, uh, how can I say, arrangement for students with a, a, a rector for each college and uh, where specific learning, teaching, and research activities take place. So you can imagine that University of Pavia, Pavia characterizes uh, itself as a traditional, long-standing, interdisciplinary, but above all, in-presence university. So with this kind of background, you can imagine what COVID provoked and what COVID um, crisis was so serious for us. In fact, it was an unwelcome guest to be hosted. Why? At that time, no campus video conference system was ready at our university. There were separate cloud systems between teachers and students. 
and we have no possibility to put them in communication. We were in a situation to have a lack of digital skills, not only in the teaching staff, but generally in the staff and generally also in the student body. Since we are, we strongly want to be an in-presence university for our structures, for our roots, for our history. So, in this scenario, about 30 people in my university were asked to react immediately to find solution. The rector had meeting with uh, some people in university, and of course, we as unit were part of these 30 people, and asked us, please find a way to, to react immediately, just to avoid to stop the activity of the university. There, were, there was no time to prepare specific plans, but the request was to use plain tools and plain methods to react in a few hours. And we succeed, we were able to do this. So the University of Pavia didn't stop and we were able to achieve the results and to satisfy our rep. So it was not important how we did this, but we did. So there was, in a certain time, the sun after the storm, but it was not the same sun. Because COVID provoked a sort of a change of mind setting, and there was a change in the scenario post COVID. First of all, expectations from students. Um, they learned that different things, different methodologies, different perspectives were possible for the University of Pavia. And they started to ask more and more and more to the governance body of the university. Moreover, in that period, we acquired, we bought for million of euros, new digital tools in each room of the University of Pavia. And we were able to, bought, to buy uh, infrastructures, both from digital infrastructure and physical infrastructures in the rooms. So we had a lot of tools and the possibility to use them. According to this, new digital methodologies, new path, new way to do things. COVID was really a surprise, both from a negative and positive point of view. So in University of Pavia, a lot of discussion took place regarding education innovation, internationalization, and uh, our um, possibility to take part in uh, European alliances with the European campuses introduced more and more variable to discuss about the new role of the university and new perspectives for the future. So what, how to react? Um, how to do, uh, how to strive for the future. What is the way to undertake? So the reflection were about trying to understand which is the climate, which is the mood, which is the environment for universities familiar with us, with the university like that share with us histories and tradition. That is the University of the Coimbra Group. And the Coimbra Group produced a very interesting report you can see on the left. And with this report, I had the impression, and uh, the idea was correct, that main challenges and mainstream lines uh, to take in consideration were this four for the future, digitalization, professional development, inclusion, and well-being. And of course, if you think about this, you can easily understand that each of these four 
mainstream are in strict linked and uh, collaboration with the other three. So, first point of reflection. What were we able to do under the point of view of digitalization post-COVID, which is the lesson learned? First of all, we were able to take, to take uh, our infrastructure for digital and cloud infrastructure connected, acquiring Zoom as a software video conference, and putting it in communication, in strict communication and personalization with each professor of our university with Google Drive. So the idea is that using Zoom, you have the recording fact on Google Drive automatically. And this was a great advancement for, uh, how can I say, the recording artifact of my university. Then we worked a lot on uh, physical infrastructure, uh, using money coming from minister or regional body, acquiring a lot of uh, useful tools, as you can see in the images, uh, automatic camera, uh, specific uh, uh, features for uh, rooms, uh, specific tablet where professors were autonomous in how to manage the room. Uh, the possibility to use the computer room or the personal computer of the professor, software for interaction inside the room in order to foster collaboration and discussion between uh, groups of students in the room. And this was the work that we did on the room of the university. And then we bought a laptop on the uh, right box, you see, a uh, smart board. And I think they are very fruitful tools because they have a camera, array of microphones and speakers integrated. Uh, they are so sensible to the touch. They have uh, uh, a large angle of vision. They can recognize the object in which, in, with which you touch the surface, so you can use your hand or you can, or you can use normal um, pencil. There is integrated wireless. There is compatibility with the Windows, Apple, uh, Android, and Chrome, and a lot of external um, port that you can use to connect any kind of device. So, with these tools, we can use these tools and this smart board for three particular functions. They are, in the same time, a computer, a projector, and a board. So, with a unique uh, object, you can collect all of these three functions in the room. And you can have, in each room of the University of Pavia, web conference simply using the license of Zoom, and in the property, in the, in the availability of each professor. So it is really a Windows open to the world. And finally, we bought a lot of particular tools, for example, for scientific application. You can see in the box at the bottom, uh, an automage, a digital table when you, where you can study uh, anatomy uh, in a three-dimension um, Possibility. Then, from the point of view of digitization, we produced a lot of movie and video and film to all the staff of the university, to the whole staff of the university, both, uh, sorry, to students, to staff, to faculties, in order to help them, help them in improve their skills. Finally, from the point of view of digitalization, we had a great re reorganization of all the platform of the university. We had in the past 22, 25, and now we have only four, four platform for normal curriculum, extra curriculum, digital corporate training, and examination. I want to remark and I want to stress, I want to highlight that 
All this production are from the staff of the University of Pavia with no money and using absolutely open source software. No expense for the University of Pavia, only, how can I say, know-how and human resources and a lot of work, of course. From the point of view, the first point was digitalization. The second point is professional development. We are in touch with the, the University of Padova, who are really mastering this, and we are preparing um, for our professor that voluntarily can access to this program, courses for innovation in uh, teaching and learning innovation, education innovation. On the, on the left, you can see the program base, and on the right, you can see the box that show the advanced course. So the idea is to have researchers and people willing to, uh, researcher, professor, uh, undertaking a first course base on the left, the program, and advanced course on the right. At the same time, we will organize for our professor uh, awards in order to um, remunerate them with a sort of prize, giving them uh, open badges and uh, a sort of um, recognized event in which they will be uh, uh, highlighted as professors that want to innovate education in University of Pavia. All this is under the schema of a Kirolab, who is uh, the structure uh, I have the honor to, to guide and to, to, to lead. And I invite you to, to see to the four icon of the logo, that is, of course, internet, World Wide Web, any kind of device that you can use. So bring your own device and be flexible on the device. Uh, the cloud architecture for our is very, very important to use, the cloud architecture. And at the end, open software. Of course, we use Moodle but generally speaking, open software. We have people able to uh, modify software, create software, so we are independent from uh, uh, private companies. Of course, we use private company, but we are we want to stay independent. From the point of view, sorry, five minutes, uh, and then uh, from the point of view of inclusion, uh, we are um, introducing policy to work with this kind of students and we produced a book and a lot of course, recorded course, um, in order that this student can attend this course and have policy of inclusion. So working students, caregiver, parents, student, athletes, disabled, and so on. So we are working and we have a lot of material for them. Well-being, you have the, the slide and um, here we have a very perfect definition of well-being and this definition come from a European Alliance University in which the University of Florence take part. I think that this definition is really perfect for at the present time of what we uh, mean for well-being. Future perspective that I am at the end of my presentation. As University of Pavia, we take part in a European campus of city university since Pavia, Poitiers, Salamanca are completely identified with the ancient university they lost. So we had the first tour of uh, the city university and we are now working, yesterday we have a meeting with Francois here in line. This will be the future direction we want to create a global campus tools and platforms. We want to have international pedagogical collaboration with seminar. We want to create a common pedagogical uh, platform uh, between our professor creating shared, shared courses. We want to create collaboration between school and the cities. And we want to foster bottom-up projects from students. Conclusions. From my point of view and what we have done in, our, in my university, 
Uh, COVID was a tragedy, especially in Italy, with a lot of uh, people passed away. And uh, bringing uh, with uh, it a lot of challenges. A CDC for us is no more uh, saying uh, Avanti Cristo or Dopo Cristo, that is uh, before Christ or after Christ, but anti COVID and Dopo COVID, before the COVID and post COVID for us. It's a joke, of course. Uh, we want to discuss about pedagogical innovation and digital innovation. There, there is no uh, sort of hierarchy between these two uh, terms, but they working together since a lot of time. The digital innovation is a factor of changing mind for us. And so what we have for new in digital field is changing our mindset. So they go together. Well-being as a response to the world crisis, European alliances and the European campuses, I really believe this, will be the catalyst for change. And we have two main documents to look at for the future digital education action plan and the European strategies for universities. That is the European way to higher education stay together, create together, be the lighthouse of the future, be the actor of green and digital transition. I am at the end. Jacek, uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you very much for your friendship. Uh, Jacek, you are a valuable colleague, a dear friend. I am going to miss you as a colleague. I will not miss you as friend. We will stay friend forever. Thank you, Elena, and uh, I would like to welcome uh, uh, Max uh, Fulhet uh, from the uh, University of Uppsala. And actually, two weeks ago, uh, the high-level seminar of the Congra Group Universities took place uh, at Uppsala, and uh, Max was the main organizer. Yes, I guess uh, that you still remember, but you are not tired just now. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Jacek, uh, and uh, good to see you again. Uh, and hello, Krakow. Good to see you too, Elena, Bonsoir. Old friends, old colleagues by now. Um, I am going to talk to you briefly about um, one place where I've spent a large part of well, the, my, my, my last 10 years as educational developer at the University of Uppsala in Sweden. And my background is within the humanities. I'm a classical archaeologist and ancient historian by training. Uh, but since 2006, I've also spent a lot of time assisting teachers to develop their teaching and specifically with different digital resources and tools. And from the outset, mostly with online sources, uh, resources, but since 2010, I've been working in the experimental classroom and in Uppsala University, and that would be the subject of uh, this presentation. Um, I call it exploring space. It is an experimental classroom, which really deserves that room. Teachers come here together with the students to explore different ways of developing their teaching, teaching and learning practices. And um, sorry, was it a comment? Sorry, no. Um, the experimental classroom um, was the outcome of a couple of years of cooperation with Stanford University, where there was a, a learning lab. Uh, and um, as a result of that, and a couple of trips to Stanford and Stanford visiting in Uppsala, uh, it was decided to um, construct this room, which is a spectacular room. Uh, it's sort of suspended in midair as you enter the campus Blås and Hoops, where also the uh, the departments for teacher training and psychology are housed. It's a centrally placed campus and it was inaugurated in 2010. And the experimental classroom is a resource which is open to all faculty, wherever they are in the university, and which is important, it is available at no cost. Otherwise, as soon as you um, 
uh, you book a room for teaching in Uppsala, uh, there will be some amount of money transferred from the department. But this is meant to be uh, a resource for teachers to come and experiment, to explore. And in order to lower thresholds, we have decided that we will not charge teachers anything. If they come here, we don't charge them anything. And, and from a practical point of view, uh, the responsibility for running this room and this facility is shared between the our unit of academic teaching and learning, which is which is my unit, and the IT division, because it is a room, of course, with lots of technology, is as is the room nowadays. It is a circular room with glass walls, spectacular, you could say. Many students and teachers experience a sort of wow moment when they enter the room for the first time. And um, Lots of screens about, interactive whiteboards, five of them in all, and four other huge screens. And all the furniture in the room can be rolled about and, or stowed away, because it all comes rolling on wheels. So it's highly flexible in that way. And you can choose what to display on these. You can have different uh, sources for each of these screens, or you could have the same image essentially shown on all uh, screens if you prefer that. And we can also divide the room. The room itself in itself is flexible. It can be divided in two halves with a sliding wall. It can be done in four or five minutes during a coffee break. Um, and one of the halves can also be partitioned in two quarters by uh, another sliding wall. So uh, during a, a typical teaching uh, uh, section of some 90 minutes, the teacher can actually, perhaps with the help of students, change the outline of the room and then change it back towards the end, for example, allowing for group work, you know, part of the uh, part of the session and whole group work in another part. So what most people think of when they enter the room is this spectacular side, which is the amount of technology that they see and, and the and the and the it is uh, the view and 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 the, uh, the the furniture and so on. But I would say that the most important aspect uh, is another one essentially. And that is the way the process in which the teachers and then the students are involved when they come to the room. And that is why it has become a, a resource really, a tool for educational development. Uh, when teachers wish to uh, book the room, they can search on a web page for free time slots and then they fill in an online form simply. And then they are contacted by an educational developer. Uh, me or one of my colleagues who will contact the teachers and make uh, an appointment then. Um, and uh, we'll just ask a few simple introductory questions at this early stage. Uh, but then we have an advanced meeting for teachers who are new to the classroom, who are there for the first time, where the teacher and the educational developer in question meet in the experimental classroom and plan the teacher's coming session there. Uh, and we really start by asking, what, why do you wish to come here. What, what, what is the course which you are teaching? Tell us a little bit about your course, your teaching. So we start typically not by presenting the, the, the classroom, but by asking them questions about their teaching, because that is the should be at the center of things. And only after this initial conversation about the teaching and their teaching goals, uh, we start discussing how they could use the uh, uh, facilities of the experimental classroom in order to develop their particular course. And we offer, uh, of course, we talk about the, the technology, we talk about the room, we have advice to give, but uh, of prime importance is, of course, that by now we have a sort of resource bank of other teachers who have been here, who have tested different things, and we can suggest those, the examples of other teachers, actual teachers, uh, what they have done and suggested to them, perhaps that could be interesting to you. It worked like that for this teacher. It seems that this might, with, we should tweak it a little, but it might work for your teaching too. So we discuss together with the teacher and arrange, arrange them for a setup for their session or sessions if they come several times. And of course, there are also uh, technology, te te technology to allow for uh, uh, online participation, hybrid situations and so on. It goes without saying these days, doesn't it? And then the teacher comes there uh, and we 
sort of prepare the classroom and we sit in the educational developers we sit in during the session as much as our time allows it uh, and follow what happens we can also assist with technology uh, but i should also add that even if in educational tech um, if one of us developers are not there there is always technological support available just a few meters away there's one person who will always be there and when we sit in there, uh, we observe what happens simply. And afterwards, we evaluate this quickly with the teacher. So how, what do you think? How did it work? And they have thought of some things. We have heard and seen other things, perhaps. And we discuss how we perhaps could change everything to the next time and so on. So there's also this evaluation. And when the teacher has had her or his last sessions in the experimental classroom, we will also have a final discussion and follow up. Um, where we wish to hear what what did the students think? Could we could you ask them some questions about this in a course of evaluation, for example, typically and so on? And actually, it is this part which really makes this room into something else. The the not only technical but also pedagogical support, which is an invitation to experiment, an, ex, an invitation to exploring, testing things, and we try to lower the risk always involved when you start testing and exploring new territory uh, by making it easy. Uh, no additional costs, uh, and by making it secure, they have the technical support close at hand whenever they come there. And then we have the discussion s focusing on the pedagogical aspects all the time for their teaching. The results, some of them from these last years. As I mentioned, this conversational approach, we don't start by selling in the classroom at all costs. We start this conversational approach departure with departure in their actual teaching. What is, what is the course to teach? Tell us about it. We are interested. Um, and we always then let the teaching requirements and the teacher's ideas come first in the discussion. We have realized that the flexibility of the room, actually, or, or the furniture of the walls and so on, actually often is more important than the technology. And as to the technology, it isn't that high tech, really. The interactive whiteboards, such as the same thing that Elena talked about, uh, they are really not cutting edge technology, but it is also rather simple and basic and also, in fact, rather flexible technology. That is good, I think. Some teachers uh, sort of command the classroom and uh, uh, start of, uh, taking control of everything. We encourage them to let the students work instead. Um, I talked about that, uh, the technological support. And we have come to realize that it's, you, we should never underestimate the potential effect of these simple adjustments to a course. Very small adjustments may have big effects. And we have been surprised and interested in seeing how the simple things of letting the students move about and standing up instead of sitting down the results of that are sometimes amazing. Sometimes it doesn't do very much, but often it is uh, intriguing and very, very interesting to see what you can achieve when you have a room where there is movement in the room. We've also realized that it's good to allow for development over time. We allow teachers to come here for um, several, uh, not only for three or four sessions, some teachers have actually run the entire courses there. So they have been able to adjust the course while they run it in this hall. And we've also seen how this has had has influenced development of new learning spaces in other parts of Uppsala University. There are challenges. It is a spectacular room, and if the things that the uh, teachers do there are not very spectacular, if it's very, if it's a, yeah, they hold a traditional lecture in a spectacular room and nothing else, then the students may get disappointed. So we warn teachers about this. If you come here, you should rethink your course, you should rethink what, how you wish to use the room really as it is and the technology and the flexibility and so on. Uh, you have to do something out of the, your normal way you're doing things. Otherwise, the, t the students will wonder why did they, what, what the, why did our teacher drag us here from another campus area if nothing new happens. Uh, as a sort of, as a result of its success, you can say that we have lots of other not as spectacular, but really very flexible and basically very good new learning environments at university. As we are not so unique any longer, how should we, what should we do next? We have to bring the hall to the next level in some sense. We are thinking a lot about that. We have some problems attracting new teachers, 
and while we have several returning veterans of the experimental classroom who come back from time to time, they still do excellent teaching, but they, there's no more this phase of development. Um, and we do realize that we do have a lack of research. We are not uh, permitted, actually, as we are part of the uh, university administration, we are not formally admitted ourselves to conduct research on what is happening there. We will try to connect researches in some way to what is going on there to evaluate it in a more profound sense. So we think this is about exploring space, exploring teaching space. And I think this is a side of teaching of educational development to see it as a research in that way that we explore new territories, that we take that risk. And sometimes we cannot predict what will happen. And sometimes teachers come with suggestions that we cannot at first see that this is something terribly exciting about it, but we discuss it with them, um, we let them do it, and as often as not, it, we are surprised what comes out of it. And I would say that in the majority of cases, this, that surprise is a pleasant one. We are exploring, we are finding, we are charting territory. There is terra, terra incognita written there in one space on the map. That is what we are doing sometimes. We're exploring new ways of teaching and inviting the teachers to do that. So thank you for this court presentation. Uh, they can find information about the experimental classroom and uh, you can put any questions to me and do come to a visit as Jacek, my dear friend, my dear colleague, you've been there three times. Uh, I hope you can come back even after your retirement and I do hope sometime in the future to come to Krakow and visit you again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matt, uh, Matt uh, thank you uh, very much indeed. And the discussion will uh, uh, follow the, the last uh, presentation of Francois. Uh, Francois uh, Leselier, uh, Poitiers University, uh, professor of this university, and he's uh, much interested also on gay, uh, gaming. Yes, uh, and as far as I know, this uh, would be the title of your presentation. By the way, uh, Francois is vice chairman of the Education Innovation Working Group of the Coimbra Group Universities, and uh, Elena, Max, and me in the past, and now uh, Damian are members of this group. Thank you very much, Max, and Francois, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jacek, for this uh, invitation and for this seminar. It was really a pleasure to uh, to work with you toward all those years. So I will speak about one example of how we can use innovative pedagogy at the University of Poitiers. So I will talk about Minecraft for project management and how to give you some examples on how we use it at the University of Poitiers and how we analyze the students' engagement within those new innovative pedagogy. So I'm Francois Le Cellier, I'm Associate Professor in Computer Science, and I will speak to you about Minecraft. So what is Minecraft? If I speak about Minecraft with my students, I don't have to ask them what it is, because in general they know, they knew. But for everyday life. Minecraft, it's a sandbox video game. It's a bit like the Legos, but in a virtual world. The player can build, destroy, create, only with the limits of his imagination. It's also the most played game in the world. There are more than 200 million copies sold and nearly uh, 140 million monthly active players, so it's a very, very popular game. Minecraft, it's not a game with realistic graphics. If we check how it looks like, it's really quite simple, just cubes, a bit like Legos. But you can do almost everything you like with it. And how to use a video game in higher education? Why? did I wanted to use Minecraft in my courses. It's because uh, in my Institute of Technology, I was asked to teach project management to bachelor students in computer science and electrical engineering. I was asked to 
to teach them transversal skills, how to plan a project, how to communicate with each other, how to collaborate, how to lead a project from scratch. It can be done uh, when you work with master students. You can do that in real world projects, for example, in computer science for to program some kind of things to, cre to create an electrical device. But when you work with first year bachelor students, it's more difficult to separate the transversal skills and the disciplinary one. But they knew Minecraft already. So if you use Minecraft, you can do all of that because students are aware on how to plan their project, how to communicate, how to collaborate, and they can then take into account their knowledge of the game into the new transversal skills I want to teach them. So if we use Minecraft to do that in practical, we have groups of six students working together on a specific spot in the virtual world. They have eight hours with the teacher to plan their work, to build what they want and to present their work. But in total, they have one month to build their own creation. So they can work also in autonomy. It's also very important to gain, uh, to be more and more autonomous for students in the current world when also we want to teach them transversal skills. I will just show you some examples of what the students have created during the past few years. It's just some examples of creation of students and you will see they are quite inventive. Because if you look at this slide, you have just here the different students working in the classroom. So they have uh, places with six computers, you can work in groups, and then three examples of their creation. So a small village, uh, something uh, like in the United States, in the far west, li like we can say, and something more fantastic with the dragon and the castle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can see here the specific spot they have, and they cannot um, get outside of this spot. It allows us also to check whether they plan their work accordingly to the space they have or not. So we have all the, this information, all this uh, data that are collected for the students and also for me to be able to evaluate the work of the students. How did I uh, use that and how to uh, have the advantages and the drawbacks of using a video game into a classroom? It's not that easy, but yes, the students know the game. It's a very big advantage because if they knew the game and they are very familiar with, they can create things without my help to on the technical approach. I can teach them the different, um, the different transversal skills, but not the technical ones. They can work on their own and then design almost everything they like. It helps also students to engage and to communicate. I've seen many times now that the students that are using the, the game are less shy to express themselves, less shy to communicate with each other, less, less shy to collaborate with each other. It's very, very important for project management skills. They can also learn in a different environment. It's always interesting and the students like to learn using a game. And they understand that it is learning using a game. There are also drawbacks. And you can say that I've been mistaken because I have the, exactly the same drawbacks as the advantage. The students know the game and are very familiar with. But it's also a drawback because if they knew the game, they, can, they know also how to push the limit and to test the boundaries of the game. So to try to bypass the limits the teacher sends. But it's quite easy to 
set uh, frontiers and barriers. If you say, okay, your limit is there and the limit of the course is that one. If you have quite a small adjustment with the game, it's also quite easy. So sometimes it's also complex to see each student's work. They are working in six, by group of six. So it's always a bit complex to know exactly what which students work on which specific spot, spot of their virtual world. But it's also uh, quite uh, rewarding to know, to see the evolution of the construction. It's a bit time consuming to check the virtual world every day <laughs> during one month to see if everything is okay. But otherwise, everything runs quite smoothly, except sometimes for the acceptations of the colleagues saying, okay, in your course, you are playing video games, but no, I'm not playing video games. I'm teaching using a video game. So how to measure that the students are really learning by using this game? How to measure also the student's engagement during those specific uh, time slots? We can ask the students how they like the course, just like that. And when we ask them how they like the course before using Minecraft and after using Minecraft, the increase of positive evaluation, it's 36% more than traditional way to learn project management. We have also tons of feedbacks and comments. I just put three there, but I have hundreds of them. They like to learn with the game, to have fun using it, to have fun by learning, and it's also motivating to use the game. They have, they have on almost total freedom and they like to be autonomous. And something that is quite rare, I think, uh, for bachelor students, they say that they had not enough time in the classroom, not enough time slot to learn and to teach. So that's very interesting. How to measure the, the, the new skills? Of course, their grades are improving. So if they use a traditional way and if they use Minecraft, their grades are improving. The students are, after creating the projects with Minecraft, they are volunteer to create new projects. They are not in the virtual world, but in the real world. And we have, when we ask students to give, uh, give us feedback on what they are doing, we have more feedback on the project management than on the technical skills. Of course, they cannot say, I put a block there. It's not very interesting. So they, they are forced to really give feedback on the project management skills. But that's not the only way to measure the student's engagement. And then the research can to do some research on student's engagement. We have used eye tracking technology. So eye tracking, the glasses that I show just there, that are, that are glasses to measure the direction of the gaze and to follow the gaze of students during the course. So we can measure the visual attention of students using those glasses, which are uh, manufactured by the company Toby. And we have a scene camera that can record everything that the students are seeing. And we have also infrared captors that, uh, that can follow the gaze of students. So we can, in the classroom, put the glasses to a student and see exactly what he is looking at. We have done an experimental protocol with 14 students to we wearing the glasses for 30 minutes in two different courses. The project management with Minecraft in the computer science that I explained and a computer science tutorial, just paper, paper pen, and uh, some exercises uh, in a standard classroom, no computer there. And we have identified the gaze fixation on three main areas. One is the computer or the paper and the notes. One is the board and the other one is the teacher. And we have compared those different uh, areas. First, I will present you the head maps. So, Whenever the students look at some point, it turns more red if more students are looking at this point. 
you can see that in the computer science tutorial, the gaze of students is less focused on something. In Minecraft activity, is more focused on the center of the screen. Here, it's less focused, it goes on the different sides, etc., etc. So the students are looking at all the things that the computer, the teacher, and the board. They are looking at their fellow uh, students, they are looking at their phones, they are looking at other things. That, that's quite amazing uh, indeed. They have the glasses, they know, they knew that it records everything that they, do, they are doing, but they are still looking at their phones. And if you look at the result fixations on the specific uh, three main areas, you see that in the computer science tutorial, they have 60% of the time that they are looking on the three main areas. But on the Minecraft activity, it's 80% of the time. So their visual attention is more focused on the specific course when they are using Minecraft than when they are in a standard course with paper and pen. So to conclude, it's quite interesting to know that the students are active and engaged in the classroom when they are using Minecraft. They have more visual attention compared to other courses and they acquire transversal skills. Of course, as Matt says, we'd like to have more research activity on the different topics and perhaps Matt we can discuss afterwards to know whether eye tracking can be used in the experimental classroom and why not in co collaboration with Coimbra Group. So, Thank you all for your attention and thank you again. So, yes. uh, Elena, uh, Max, and Francois, I would like to thank you uh, wholeheartedly. Really, really thank you very much for my last uh, online seminar at the Jagiellonian University.